Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Friday Night Live. Um, you probably all know anyway, but my guest, my guest tonight is um, Janet Gorand. Have I said your surname correctly there? Gorand. Gorand, right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. got a French husband. Right, okay, I did wonder, okay. Um, <laughs> and obviously, you're the founder of Tribe Sober. That's true, yes, yeah. Excellent, so welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Um, so I thought what we'd do tonight, if you, if we talk about your story and what you offer, so tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, okay, well, maybe just a few biographical details and then I'll dive into my, uh, my sorry tale of the drinking. <laughs> but uh, I was born in Oxford, uh, but I spent most of my life in London. And professionally, I was in human resources, training and development. And I worked for a long time at Christie's, which you probably know. I was the HR director there. Mm. And it was a fabulous job. I loved it. And I traveled around the world, really, with that job. Uh, but I also had to do, because I was in HR, it was quite, well, not that funny, but <laughs> looking back. But at the time, I liked it because... Um, it was part of my job to make sure that our treasured art specialists were happy, you know, because Sotheby's was always after them, trying to poach mm. them. So, of course, the way that I did that was I took them out to wonderful restaurants for lunch and, you know, bought them nice wine and chatted them up and made sure that they were happy at work, etc. So that was literally part of my job. So, uh, that was, uh, you know, the drinking came in a little bit then. And then, of course, traveling, you know, because Christie's have got uh, offices all over the world. So I did lots of traveling. So, um, yeah. And then when I was, uh, when was it? 2000, the year 2000, uh, my husband and myself, we um, went to Cape Town on holiday. And we just fell in love with the place, really. And... He was kind of nearing retirement and I was getting really fed up with the corporates thing. And I always wanted to do my own thing. So we decided to move here, you know, because our kids were all grown up. You know, we're second marriage, but kids grown up. So we moved here, which was rather impulsive, but we've been kind of happy living here happily ever since. I was consulting in HR for the first um uh, I think about eight years I did here and, and I loved it because it was a nice different environment for me. I was doing lots of the kind of black empowerment, you know, the score scorecard that they have here. And it was so different and so interesting, did lots of training. So that's a bit about me. Yes, I'm uh, married um, with a grown up son and a chihuahua. <laughs> uh, yeah, what else should I tell you? So let me tell you about the drinking because as I was saying to you before you press the live button, um, I, I've run 65 workshops now. They used to be face-to-face, -face, but now they're on Zoom. And at the beginning of every workshop, because people are, are a bit nervous, you know, they're, they're very apprehensive when they turn up. <laughs> they're always worried that they'll see someone they know, but I always tell them, well, it doesn't matter because you're they're in the same boat, really. So, um, to put them at their ease, I told them my story. So uh, I've actually told this story for six, 65 times, and this is the 66. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the way that I tell it, so it's not too long and rambling, because obviously I'm quite old now, so it's a long story. But um, what I do is I divide it into three wake-up calls, and the first two I ignored, and the third I finally listened to. But my first wake up call was at the age of 25, because I lived in a flat in London with four other girls, you know, in when I was in my 20s, actually, I worked at the BBC and we all had good jobs, you know, and, but in the evening, the wine would come out and whatever. And, you know, I used to, I, I guess I was daily drinking even then and I'd have, you know, two, two glasses, maybe three but sometimes when we had people around, I'd have more. And I think, you know, I, I knew that I loved wine and I loved drinking, but it didn't bother me. I mean, we were all a bit like that anyway, so you don't even notice it. But the, my first wake-up call, the age of 25, I woke up in hospital one morning 
and I had no idea where I was, what hospital I was in, why I was there, just knew that I felt terrible. Um, and I had to, uh, one of my flatmates came to see me and, and she told me what had happened. So what had happened was, you know, we were all drinking away and I was going a bit over the top as usual. And what I'd, I'd announced at about midnight that I was going to bed and I decided to have a bath. Well, I didn't decide anything because I was completely blackout drunk, but I was on automatic pilot. You know how you find yeah. yourself just doing stuff. I remember one of your stories about that. <laughs> when you couldn't remember anything. So it was just my habit to always have a bath before I went to bed. It still is. So um, what had happened is I'd gone into the bathroom and I'd locked the door, which I usually do because do, we're sharing a flat. And then uh, I'd got in the bath and then my flatmates, they went to bed about, you know, 20 minutes later and they just knocked on the door to say goodnight and they got no reply and then they knocked a bit harder, still no reply, started hammering on the door and no reply. So then they panicked, you know, and they rang 999 <laughs> and, you know, that they, they explained. So the fire brigade turned up, would you believe, <laughs> with an ambulance and they knocked the door down and sure enough, I was under the water, you know, so if my flatmates hadn't have bothered or if they'd have been as drunk and stupid as I was, I, I certainly wouldn't be here today. No. So that was my first wake up call. And in fact, in the hospital, there was a psychiatrist there that came to see me and he said, um, so, you know, tell me, what did you try? Were you trying to kill yourself? And I said, no, I was having a really nice evening. But he, he thought, you know, I should have a session. I said, no, I'm fine. I'm just a bit hungover. Yeah. And what we did is all of us, we just laughed it off. You know, it became a joke, a legend. You know, it was one of the stories. And people used to mm. say, oh, did you hear about Janet in her bath? You know, what an idiot. So, <laughs> so that was yeah. wake up call number one. So, you know, went on working, living in the flat, enjoying our lives. And then when I was 30, I got married for the first time. Um, and he was a drinker as well. You know, we met in a bar, you know, always drinking. And he also had a good job. And we, we were very functioning alcoholics. Well, we didn't, we never would have said we were alcoholics at the time, but I would now. And we both, you know, held the jobs together. And, but every night the wine would be out and we'd have a shot of Jack Daniels probably when we got home. And we'd have dinner parties that went on till three o'clock in the morning. And I still remember all the bottles on the table. But all of our friends were like that, you know, mm. so we'd really normalised it totally. And um, that, that went on quite, uh, quite OK and our careers developed. I had my son and uh, I did stop drinking for nine months, but I found it a real trial, you know, and I knew that I would be drinking again. I was literally counting the days and I was so happy when we could finally celebrate his birth. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, back, back to it. And then into my early 40s, um, then I got married, I got divorced and married again. And I would say, just to tease my second husband, that that's when the trouble started, because he's French and they've got a very different attitude to the Brits with drinking. You know, they they don't go out to get hammered. You know, it doesn't really occur to them to keep drinking. And he, you know, kind of noticed my drinking and used to kind of grumble a bit. And I remember our honeymoon, we went to Barbados and uh, we were sitting at the beach bar and I was knocking about the rum punches. And the way that he tells it, he just turned around to say something to me and I'd slipped off my bar stool and I was just lying in the sand. <laughs> and he was mortified, you know, whereas my first husband just would have laughed his head off, you know, and teased me relentlessly the next day. But this one, you know, he's, he was quite cross about it. And he said, oh, I was so embarrassed having <laughs> to carry you back to the room. And so he, he wasn't into the drinking, didn't like it at all. So because I wanted to stay with him, I tried to cut down. And that's when I realised I was dependent because it was so difficult. Mm -hmm. I looked up what the uh, low risk levels were, you know, a bottle and a half a week, and I thought, oh, no, I drink that every night. You know, what are they talking about? 
but I tried and I had a little diary and I used to write down all the units and sometimes you know by sheer willpower I could keep going for three weeks and then the wheels would come off and I'd get blackout and drunk and we'd have a huge row and be round and round in circles and that went on for 10 years would you believe because and and the reason was I couldn't bear the thought of never drinking again mm. I just couldn't imagine life without alcohol life without wine you know what would that look like so um it never crossed my mind to stop completely and, and looking back I think oh god you know it's so much easier just to ditch the bloody stuff than to try mm. and control it it's an old, it's an addictive drug so yeah. um you know this went on for 10 years and during that time I had wake up call number two which was breast cancer and it was quite serious you know I had to have a mastectomy and chemotherapy and it was a, a very difficult year really but I carried on drinking because I felt sorry for myself I thought well I'm gonna die anyway so mm. <laughs> I might as well drink I think I did change from white wine to red wine because I thought well red wine's good for your health you know this kind of nonsense that I'd read in a mm. magazine somewhere so um, that was wake up call number two. And of course, now I understand a lot more about this subject. So I'm convinced that my decades of heavy drinking is linked to, to that breast cancer because it's kind of proven now. But at the time, I, I was in denial. And I'll always remember my oncologist when he kind of signed me off as much as they can with that thing. Um, I said to him, I don't want to go through this again. Tell me what to do. You know, I'll do anything. I'll I'll drink water. I'll eat plants, whatever. I'll do it because I'm so committed now to staying healthy. And he said, no, no. He said, you must. He said, you've got out of this now. You must go away and enjoy the rest of your life. You know, you must eat and drink and just be happy. So I felt like I'd been given carte blanche. <laughs> so yeah. off I go again, you know, drinking, drinking husband furious um yeah so that went on and we moved to South Africa where <laughs> for a Brit I think when you arrive here it's like you've died and gone to heaven because not only does everybody sit around drinking just like you do in the UK but the sun is shining <laughs> as well so I, I just loved it here and uh, the first few years you know I was I was fine I was consulting and um, drinking in the evenings but still functioning and then uh, I had my third wake up call which I finally listened to because it was a walking talking blackout as I called it because I'd, I'd had lots of blackouts well obviously the first one in the bath but since then I'd have lo lots of those kind of blurry blackouts you know when you can't remember quite how the evening ended and you discover that someone's not speaking to you and you can't imagine why not and what you've said to them those mm. kind of blackouts and I would wake up and think oh where's my handbag where's my jacket that kind of nonsense you know so uh, I'd, I'd had loads of those obviously hundreds of them I guess but uh, this was was different because I was away for the weekend with some friends. We, we'd rented a beautiful house here on the West Coast. There were about 10 of us. And the host was a very bon viveur, you know, big drinker. And it, we started on the bubbly at breakfast time on the Saturday and it just went on and on. And then on the Sunday morning, I woke up and I, just, I felt so weird and so ill and like, I just couldn't remember anything, but I was certainly not going to admit, you know, how ill I felt. I had the, the stiff upper lip, you know, the British approach. I'm fine. <laughs> Bit fragile, but I'm fine. So big breakfast, bubbly's out again. And um, I said in little chirpy voice, why don't we walk down to the next village? Because um, I've heard that there's there's a beautiful house there. So next time we come this way, maybe we rent that one. And, and the, the whole table went a bit uh, silent and people started looking a bit embarrassed. And someone said, uh, Janet, we went to look at that house yesterday afternoon. You were with us and you seemed fine. You weren't slurring your words. You weren't stumbling. You seemed absolutely normal. And I had no recollection of an entire afternoon. So, you know, I'd lost about eight or nine hours 
And for some reason that really scared me because uh, I think by that time I was uh, beginning to acknowledge that, you know, the breast cancer and that was harming my body. But as you get older, you know, the thought that you're harming your brain as well, that, that really did it for me. So uh, I Googled what that kind of blackout was all about. And it's not just that you've forgotten stuff, but your, your brain is so soaked in alcohol that you can't, um, you can't make memories. Mm. And I thought, oh, how creepy is that? Yeah. So um, that was it. And then the next morning, on the Monday morning, I said to long-suffering husband, I said, that's it, I'm done with alcohol. <laughs> and to be fair to him, he didn't laugh or say, yeah, I heard that before. He said, oh, you've never said that before. You've always said you're going to cut down. So uh, that was the key, really, for me. And it was hard. And then, of course, once I decided I was going to ditch the stuff, then I had to work out how to do it because I was so dependent. So I trotted down to AA <laughs> and I hated that. I tried several meetings, but I don't know if I was just unlucky where I went, but um, it there were mainly men and they were a real kind of hardcore drinking in the morning kind of people that had lost everything. And I just didn't feel like they were my people, you know, and I, uh, I thought I, it was a bit counterproductive because I'd look at them and I'd think, well, I'm not like them. <laughs> Maybe I'm not an alcoholic okay. after yeah. all. Maybe I, I can just carry on with my bottle of wine at night. But I knew that I couldn't really. So I thought, well, AA isn't for me. There's got to be something better out there. So I carried on looking and I found Club Soda that you probably know in yeah. London. Yeah. And at that time, I don't think they do it anymore. But at that time, they were running workshops. So I thought, oh, that looks interesting because I was due to go home for a visit anyway. So I went and uh, it, it was great. And it was just a one day workshop and it was run by a nurse, actually, an ex-nurse. And uh, she spent the day, you know, telling us about all the harm it does to our bodies. So it was like aversion therapy. But it, it you know, it kind of um, scared me and made me realise what I was doing to myself. But the thing that really made it work for me was the people there. You know, they were all, they were women and they'd, uh, they'd all got good jobs, nice families, drinking a bottle of wine a night, but they knew that seven bottles of wine every single week wasn't cool and more at the weekends. So we kind of bonded because we all told our sad little tales and then we swapped phone numbers and I stayed connected with those ladies and I still am, you know, what's it, seven years later. And um, we managed to do it, you know, so at the workshop, we were given some tools as well to help us change our behavior. And I, I love to write. So I was doing lots of writing. I was doing a blog. And then uh, when I got back to South Africa, I was about seven or eight months sober and I was beginning to feel really good. So uh, I started to have these ideas and because you have a lot of time on your hands when you're mm. sober. <laughs> so I'm like sitting there thinking, what am I going to do with my life now? And I had this idea, this brainwave, which was, uh, well, I've run, you know, hundreds of workshops in my time as an HR person. So uh, I'm going to design and facilitate a workshop of my own in in here in South Africa, because nobody was doing that. They're still not doing that here. So that's what I did. And the first one was in November 2015, and it was fully booked and kept running them. People kept coming. And then what happened is, um, you know, people bonded just like I did when I went to my workshop and they said, oh, we want to keep in touch, you know, and we, we want more support to stay on track. So that's when I created a membership. So now people come to the workshops and they learn the theory and then they become members and then they put, we help them to implement what they've learned. So um, that's it, really. I've been doing that now for five years and uh, just got into, been doing podcasting now for the last year. 
and it, it just gets better and better and it's um it's such rewarding work you know i really find i really feel for the first time in my life that i've discovered purpose and meaning in my life because much as i love christie's you know it was only there to make the rich people richer <laughs> it wasn't very meaningful or satisfying yet this work is you know and i I see the people coming to the workshop, we hear the stories and the stories, they're all different, but they're all the same really. And it, it just strikes me, you know, what damage this stuff does to people's lives. And mm. it's, it's just very rewarding to be able to help some people get out of that. Yeah. When do you, when you quit then? So, so you had that experience and you said to your husband, that's it, I'm quitting, but yeah. you didn't actually quit at that moment. You were like, I'm going to quit. I need to find a way. And that's presumably you were, you were still drinking then, but looking around for something to work. Yeah. I mean, not excessively. I, I'd really frightened myself. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I was going to AA and then um, I found club soda quite soon afterwards. And so, did yeah, you, so I mean, that was because what, what I find quite interesting with your story is there's usually there's kind of two stages for people. One is they have to dabble in moderation because yeah one of the reasons we drink so much is because we believe we enjoy it. And the, the idea, like you said yourself, you just can't bear the thought of never doing oh. it again. So it's that thing of, I don't want to quit, but I can't carry on the way I'm going. And it's like the, uh, the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object. And, and the, yeah. the, the idea is, well, okay, I'll moderate. Um, and then you go through an extended period usually. And it's almost the most heartbreaking part of the entire thing because that's where you really start to believe you have a massive problem because you can't control it. And like you said, through sheer willpower, you can make it work for a bit. But what I found really interesting, so you, you did about a decade of that then. That's a yeah, I was I call it the moderation trap. And yeah. I do believe actually for, for many people, me included, and a bit along the lines of what you were saying, that it's almost a stage, you know, it's because any big decision in life, we have to go through a contemplation stage mm. and it's contemplation really. And, you know, I think I was really stupid to stay in contemplation for so long, but, you know, we all need to do that. Now, I don't know if you saw that study by the Tempest recently. It was very interesting. They'd asked uh, 250 people in recovery. How long was it uh, between the moment you knew you had a drinking problem to the moment when you reached out and got some help and did something about it. And the average period was uh, 11 and a half years. Right, um, okay, yeah. So. Yeah, the other thing I found interesting though, you 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 quit and that was it. Cause that's still another thing you see with a lot of people. It, it's not a single event with quite a lot of people. They try, they fail, they learn, they continue to improve. And over time they finally hit the nail on the head at some point. But that's what I found very interesting with your story. It was. You made the decision, you worked towards it and you quit and that was it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I've done all my relapsing with the um, the moderation. And yeah, I think yeah. subconsciously I knew that you keep relaxing, keep trying, keep relaxing, keep trying. And all you're doing is the hardest bit over and over again. You know, mm. that's what I tell people. There. But I have a lot of people in our community that... We, um, you know, we have annual trackers and they're a bit old school. It's just a piece of paper, really. It's a calendar with lots mm. of squares and they colour in all of their alcohol free days. And, you know, lots of them fall off the bus and they get back on the sober bus, as we call it again. But what, what's happening is they're doing what we call sober stretches and their sober stretches are getting longer and longer. And we've got a lady at the moment. We're all so thrilled with her because she... She's had 84 day ones. Wow, <laughs> and now, okay. Well, no, 84. And now she's uh, like four months sober. She's finally got it. But yes, a lot of people are like that. But with me, yeah, that was it. I was done. And a lot of yeah. people are like that. They, Especially if you're a bit older, you, you start thinking, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's, no, you just exactly. know it's destroying you. Yeah. And I, I always say, I don't have another recovery in me. <laughs> no, no. I can't do well, this think, again. I'm done with it. I think one of the big things is when, when you start to think it's a problem, it focuses your mind on it. Um, and I think what you then do is when you, because I, I say this a lot to people, really concentrate it on, concentrate on it when you're drinking it. And it's not the massively wonderful thing we think it is when we actually stop and analyze it. 
So I think if you realize you have a problem like you did, and then you go through all these years of sort of trying to come at it different angles, mainly by moderating, but what you're really doing is concentrating on it and thinking about it. And over that time, starting to work out that, that this just isn't for me. And it's almost like, it, it, to, to me, a lot of the time, it feels like, you know, trying to push a heavy weight. When you get it moving, it sort of picks up a bit of momentum. And I think that's the thing, because as you said, it's exhausting moderating, isn't it? It's just exhausting yeah absolutely yeah. exhausting so do you have people from because obviously you're based in South Africa is it mainly South African people who attend your um, workshops and well it used to be pre-pandemic although I used to come over and run them in London once a year as well oh, okay. I used to team up with Claire Pooley I expect you know her yes. I'm sure you, yeah, yeah 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 she used to come on there as a kind of guest presenter so yeah oh, we had lovely. a great time um, so yeah, when they were physical, mostly South Africans, but now, I mean, we get people from all, all over the world. We had someone from Peru on the last one, oh, okay. <laughs> I know. but mainly UK and uh, US and uh, Australia, but the time is a bit, the timing's a bit rough for them. That wasn't really but, so, so you do, you do the workshops, obviously. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You do, you do the workshops and then you've got challenges as well. You do. Yeah, yeah, every year. Well, we do a big fundraiser because there's a beautiful um, NGO here called Earth Child, and um, it's in the townships and it's in the schools. And what they do is um, they go and do yoga in the schools. And it's beautiful. You know, it sounds bizarre because obviously, you know, there's extreme poverty and violence and gang warfare and the nightmare going on. But these children, they just love their yoga and it's so beautiful to watch them. And, uh, you know, I go to their classes sometimes and I remember a little boy came and said to me, uh, oh, I love these classes. It's the only time that I dare to close my eyes. You know, these right. children have such terrible lives, but it's like, you know, a moment of peace for them and they love the postures and uh, so we, we raise money for that uh, every year, but we do that via a dry January. That's our dry January challenge. But at this time of year, we do uh, what we call sober spring because of course we're coming up to spring here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so for the Brits, it's sober autumn. And what we do for that is 66 alcohol free days. And it's great fun because we start everybody off on the same day. You know, so you've got a big group of people. It's usually 50, 60 people all doing mm. it together. And you kind of throw them all on a WhatsApp group. And they're all a bit shy to start with. But, you know, within days, they're all best buddies and sharing their, their heart with everybody else. And it, it's great fun. So for 66 days, every single day, they get um, like an email with tips, tools, inspiration. And they also get a mini podcast. We um, we've recorded 66, like five minute kind of bite-sized chunks. The idea with that is you listen um, before you go to sleep and it kind of okay. absorbed in your subconscious so, um, yeah, and we have a Zoom cafe every Saturday for them, usually with a presenter, some kind of education. And we're just posting, you know, articles and stuff on the WhatsApp group all the time. So this is our fourth year that we've run it. And the first, we, we call it the Sober Spring Bus. <laughs> and the first bus leaves uh, on the 1st of September. And then we've got another bus uh, at the end of September 27th. And the reason why we chose 66 days is because apparently in 66 days, you can build a new neural pathway. So at the end of 60, so we, we try and promote it as a health thing. You know, if you want mm. to give your body a boost, you know, have a have 66 days off alcohol and also you'll test your dependence. But also if people want to quit, it's a great way to kind of start it off because it's not forever we say avoid the f word you know just do mm. the challenge and see how you feel at the end and we've had many people that feel so amazing after 66 days that they they never drink again so it, it really does work and what often happens is people get to the 66 days and they think 
oh, you know, I'm not sure I want to drink again. I think I'll set another goal for 100 days. And we usually have these little satellite groups going on yeah, yeah. going for 100 Jump days. And then, yeah. So it's, it's a nice challenge and it's great fun. And um, it's all on our website, which is tribesober.com. And I think I just worked out what it costs in UK. I mean, everything that we do is so cheap for for brands, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because the standard (laughs) of living is is very low here. And our our currency is rubbish, you know, because there's always (laughs) terrible things happening in the country with the government. Mm. But uh, for Brits, it's £17. And our membership is a mere £4 a month. So uh, we are good value for overseas people. We have lots of Americans. So, yeah, yeah, we've got a nice international community. I was going to say, what's the sober movement like out there? Is it gathering pace generally or is it a bit behind? I know, obviously, here it seems to be ploughing ahead. Yeah, I must say um, I've heard lots of good things about the young ones in uh, in the UK. Like 25% don't drink at all. I mean, that's amazing. But here, well, here it is quite interesting because we have we've had four alcohol bans during the pandemic. Right. Okay. Because alcohol causes carnage here. You know, in the yeah. it causes car crashes, gender-based violence. Um, you know, violence generally, murders. Everything is is alcohol fueled. So the government quite cleverly just banned alcohol and then the hospitals, they had room for the COVID patients. Wow. Because the trauma units are just overrun all the time by, you know, all of these casualties that are alcohol related. Hmm. So there is, and there's obviously the legacy of apartheid is still very much with us and there's a lot of poverty. And I think young men here, it's, it's, something like 50% of them can't get a job. So, I, you know, you can imagine if you're yeah. a young man and you've got no future, what are you going to do? You know, all your friends are drinking. So mm. there's a very sad kind of drinking culture here. But having said that, the alcohol-free um, drinks market seems to have exploded here. We have so many Excellent. choices. Mm. And there's even, uh, I interviewed them for my podcast, there's a couple of ladies that have, have very cleverly set up an online shop and it's called Drink Nil. And they've got more than a hundred alcohol-free choices. You know, they've just wow. collected everything and they've got mm. lovely stuff and they'll deliver it to your door. You know, so all of our members get a discount with them and there, there's so much going on. I think we could do with a, a few alcohol, um, a few sober bars, you know, we haven't really got that yet. Where yeah. you have in England, I mean, I, I usually go to Redemption when I'm in London, which is great. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, I think the bars struggle a bit. I mean, funny enough, there was a post in yeah. the group the other day, but I think the problem is because alcohol is addictive, people yeah. go and they tend to drink and drink and drink throughout yeah. the evening. But I think yeah. with alcohol free bars, people turn up and have one or you have two a drink, so, you go. Yeah, yeah that's it or they just you know take their time over one or two there's not that panic to keep drinking yeah, so I, yeah. I, I think at the moment they don't seem to be doing particularly well they seem to open up and then a lot of them close down again so I think well, they need reduction to has done very well but because they they produce really delicious vegan food as well mm. I think yeah yeah, yeah. I think if you have the, the food side, then you've got a whole restaurant and people all sit there for, mm. a, for a meal but yeah it's uh I mean it's uh a commercial dream isn't it to have a product that <laughs> is, <laughs> just makes people the want desire for more. itself yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah and how many people have you got in your like in your social media groups then at the moment is it getting it growing yeah yeah I mean we've got a few thousand we've got about six thousand on our mailing list and then uh, I think members we've got about 350 now hmm. it's, it's not huge it's, it's still very manageable okay. Yeah. I notice you've got quite a big team of people in Tribe Sober, haven't you, offering like advice and services. There's quite a few of them on the website from all different backgrounds. You've got a nice spread of like experience, haven't you there? Yeah, well, we've got a lovely, um, we've got all these practitioners now because um, mm. we say that we, we want to take people on a seven step journey and it's not just about quitting the drink. You know, there's so much more to recovery than not drinking, isn't there? Mm. So we want 
to help them to stop drinking and then we want them to we want them to learn to thrive in their alcohol free life and to do that you have to reconfigure stuff you know and do different things and, and get healthy so we have uh, for example we have online yoga we have online therapy we have coaching and all of these people offer, you know, very discounted services or, or a complimentary. Mm. We've got a hypnotherapist that does a complimentary first session. We've got an art therapist. So we've got all of these people that like to get involved. And many of them have had problems themselves. Mm. And then we've got, you know, other people. I've got my uh, my sidekick who's from Zimbabwe, who's called Courage. And I always say we need courage in this yeah. team. <laughs> And, you know, he uh, he does a lot of the admin and he manages the challenges. So, yeah, I've been very lucky. I, I've never gone out looking for people, but it's like uh, I've got Sue as well, who's I mean, I'm rubbish with, you know, I'm not very organized. So I, I hate things like spreadsheets. So when a, a lady, a British lady came along and said, oh, I'm an accountant, you know, do you need any help? Like, yes. So yeah. she's got this massive spreadsheet with all of our members. And so she keeps everything beautifully organized. And then I can focus on writing and being more yeah, yeah. creative and uh, podcasting and stuff. So, yeah, it, we are quite a big team. Yeah, quite big, isn't it? Yeah. But we're, we're very passionate. You know, we're not doing this to make money. We've just about cover our expenses. And, yeah, and that's yeah. It. That's, we're happy with that. How did you, sorry, sorry, I know we're coming up to time now, but I was really enjoying talking to you. But how did you find, so obviously you're out in Cape Town, you've quit drinking, but you've been out there a few years and you were saying that, you know, there's quite a big drinking culture out there. So, and, and of course, as you know, when you're drinking, you make friends with people who are drinking. So you kind of, it's almost self perpetuating because you're with people who drink a lot. How did you find that side of things where you quit? And then what do you still, obviously you still socialize, but did you change your friends over the years? How did you find it when you first quit? Um, well, it shifted my kind of friendship circle did shift a little bit. So, and I lost, you know, a few people that were obviously drinking buddies and I kind of knew mm. they were drinking buddies. But most of my friends kind of stuck by me. A couple of them have also gone sober. Oh, right. And, you know, and other people are, are very impressed with what I've done. And, and I think, you know, you do your friends do have a bit of a sort out, but your real friends will stick with you. You know, they won't tell you you're boring. They'll say, amazing, well done. How can I support you? You know, how can mm. I help? That's what a real friend would say. And I've made so many new friends because of this. You know, what, what's lovely in our community is I, I, I now, you know, know a lot of people that I never would have met before. You know, my path mm. never would have crossed. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a real joy to meet people that are quite different to you but we've, we've all got this bond together because we, yeah. we understand each other and it's uh, the support you get from a community is very different from the support you get from friends and family because however much they care about you they don't really understand and they say things like well surely you can have one glass of wine yeah. it's like Duh, no I can't <laughs> <laughs> but you know you'd never say that to someone in our crowd for example and no no, no exactly yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no I think you need to mix with people that understand yeah and I think it's useful as well because it is about changing your self-image as well isn't it because we do for, we have these very strong self-images of drinking and you know we drink in this situation and that situation and it's very good to be with people then who you know who don't drink and you can sort of help to change your self-image as well as someone who doesn't drink yeah and you can have much you can I always used to think that I drank to connect with people but in fact I have much better connections now that I'm sober but much better conversations and you know people say we're boring when we don't drink but what's more boring than a bunch of drunk people telling the same story over and over again yeah drunk people become very good at talking and very bad at listening i've found yeah they yeah just broadcast and when they're not talking they just their concentration completely yeah. wavers doesn't it but i did find socializing difficult for the first few months but i forced myself out there you know i, I saw it as a challenge and every time mm. i went out i'd write it up in my journal and i'd almost tick off another box and i'd go out and i didn't really expect to enjoy myself but just felt awkward 
But uh, I went there and went there. And then I still remember one night coming home <laughs> and thinking, oh, what an interesting crowd, you know, and I'm going to meet this lady next week and I must buy that book. And, and I realised that I'd really enjoyed myself and I hadn't drunk. And that was like a turning point. Mm. And I mean, I'm not saying that everything was fantastic <laughs> after that, but that was the beginning. And I think it was because my subconscious had finally accepted, yes, you can have fun without alcohol. Because yeah. I had such limiting beliefs. It's practice, isn't it? I found that because I did a similar thing. I sort of, when I quit drinking, I just accepted that I wouldn't enjoy social situations ever again. Yeah. Um, but over time, you you do. You you know, you get back to it. And it was say, like, children enjoy social situations. We, we naturally know how to socialise without drinking, but it's something we forget when we start drinking. And when we quit yeah. drinking, we learn yeah. it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Janet, thank you so much. I want to keep talking, but it's... <laughs> time's getting on a bit <laughs> thank you so much so uh, the website is the best place for people to find you on the yeah, website then tribe tribe sober. Sober. and the the podcast is called tribe sober and we've done uh, about 60 episodes now there's one out every week and there's a great one coming out tomorrow morning they come out on saturday mornings so yeah we'd love to have some some brits <laughs> more brits we've got a few more brits. people yeah yeah Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, it's a pleasure. It's keeping touch, William. Definitely. Take care. Bye. Bye.